All right. I want to go ahead and jump into this morning's message. And this morning it is called The Game Changer. I'm going to specifically be speaking on purpose. And so let's just look at the de- definition really quickly of purpose. The reason for which something exists or something is created. As the King David wrote in Psalms 139, he began to talk about God knowing you intimately. God handcrafts each and every one of us. And he actually begins to say that he knows us so intimately that he began to place a purpose inside of us while we were still inside of our mother. And so that's a pretty big deal to hear, right? And so we know that we're created for this world. Who knows that you're created for this time right here, right now? I think a lot of times we hear the same thing. We're created just for a moment, just like this, or a time as this, as a lot of the church sayings go. But think of it this way. If you were born in the 1950s, but you still had the modern day vernacular of now, how weird would you be walking down the side of the street? And you're like, hey, bro, what's up? And they're like, excuse me? We do not use that language here, okay? And so you, you can tell that we were born for this period of time, like this time only. So, you know, we weren't born for the 1600s, although I think I'd look pretty mightily walking through, you know, mire with a huge sword on my side and a big old shield walking like, mess with me. You know, I'd feel pretty, pretty awesome being able to pull my sword out and be like, let's go, let's go to war right now. But it'd be weird because we're not from that time period. We're from this time period, and we're made just for now. So much so, I would be willing to say this, that each and every one of us has grown up differently. We have different lenses. We've actually been raised differently. Most of us were born in different places. How many people were born in Michigan? Okay, that's a lot of you. <laughs> Normally, it's not so many. Normally, it's not so many. I was not born in Michigan. I was born in the horrible state of Ohio. For all those friends and family, I love my friends and family in Ohio, but no boo to Ohio State, go green, go blue, anything besides that horrible color of red and crim- or crimson. And so one of the things is, is I know that because we've all come from different areas, we all come from different backgrounds. Some of us were born into low income class. Some of us were born into mid income class. Some of us yet were still born into high income class. Some of us were raised in the city. Some of us were raised in rural. Some of us were raised in a small village. But wherever you were raised, you have different perspectives because of that. And so because you have a different perspective, that means you have a different lens. And because you have a different lens, it means you're going to be able to have abilities to hear from someone nowadays differently than those in past. But even more so, you have unique abilities that have been deposited just into your life for today. And so before we jump too much deeper, I want to ask you guys just a few questions. And I'm asking you to be vulnerable. And I'm asking you to see some like legit hand raises. Last service, you're all like, because nobody wanted to raise their hand. But I promise you, it'll, it'll be so worth it. And so here's the three statements. If you find one of these statements that you align with, please just simply raise your hand. Nobody's going to be looking at you. We're not, not casting shame or guilt. But this is the first one. I don't feel like I have a purpose in my life. Okay. I feel like my purpose could have been destroyed by my past choices or mistakes. Okay. The last one. I don't really know if I have a purpose. I'm just trying to live my life day by day, and I'm open to discovering a purpose if it should exist. A lot of you. Okay. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, that's because you've probably discovered your purpose or because you were lying. I'm just going to assume that's because you've already discovered your purpose. But in that statement, I will say this, is if you have discovered your purpose, that means you have at one point or another felt like the people that are in this room. And so we're all in good company. There's no shame in raising your hand. <clears throat> and so... The scary part of living this way, subscribing to one of these thoughts, is that means that somewhere inside of you there's a void because you have not yet discovered your purpose. I can speak to this personally because I've lived out of that void for a majority of my life. I uh, remember sharing last week. Who was here last week, by the way? Who was not here last week? God's watching. (laughs) I'm just kidding. He is watching, but no shame. No shame. But with that being said, last week we talked about the joy box and we talked about that. And part of the joy box, <coughs> excuse me, is I had talked about my life story. And around age seven or eight years old, I remember really feeling the first time ever depression really start to set. And I felt completely alone. I felt like I had no one to turn to. And I felt like as if nobody could even care that I existed. And so I remember at age seven or eight feeling that way and going through my teen- teenage years feeling even worse and having anxiety start to come in where I felt like the world was crushing me. And I remember even getting to my adult years. And when I turned around at age 18, I began to jump job to job. This was a byproduct of what I was living. 
I would say by the age 18 to age 25, I'd gone through somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 jobs. So you don't have to hurt your brain doing the math. That's around two or three jobs a year. That's a lot. That's pretty frequent changing jobs. So why did I do that? It's because I had a void inside of me. I had an incompleteness inside of me. What ended up happening was I would get to a job and I'd be like, man, this job's going to be great. I'm going to be excellent with this and I'm going to be like the manager someday. And so I'd instantly dive in. I'd work really hard. I'd get really good at what I was doing. And before I knew it, wow, this is kind of boring. Okay, I'm going to get a new job because this will, this will solve the problem. And so then I would jump into a new job and a new job and a new job. And I'd get really good at that job. And I'd say to the point, you know, I'd get to the point where I'm like, yeah, this is all right, I guess. Making money. I guess I'll just continue on. And so I finally <clears throat> landed my job as a concrete cutter. I felt fulfilled, I think, at the very beginning because there's a lot to learn. If you've ever cut concrete, which I don't think most of you probably have been around it, but if you've ever been around the construction world, wow, is it different. It goes a lot different from working at like a Wendy's or a McDonald's or working at like a, you know, a 7-Eleven or an Old Navy or a retail place. You go into construction, it's like... And so, needless to say, I had a long way to go. And so it always left me a drive to continue to get better, to continue to get better, and continue to get better. And so my third year there, I actually set a majority of the shop averages. He used to, our boss used to actually base it off of like a, a time scale. So the faster you went, the higher your, your point scale was, per se, for that week's of job. And I got to the point where I was so good that I set, I think, out of the nine categories, categories I wasn't even supposed to be in, I think I set like eight or seven, seven of the nine categories. That means I had the sh highest shop average. And so I finally got to the point where I'm like, all right. And he goes, someday you're going to be in management. I'm like, great. And all of a sudden I'm like, but I go home and I feel incomplete. Has anybody ever had a job like that where you work super hard? Maybe you're working a job like that now where you're like, I pour all my time and my effort into this job and I'm, I'm happy that I'm making good money and I'm happy that I'm learning things and I'm happy that I'm improving myself. But man, it comes to Friday and I can't wait to get out of there because I know that I didn't get to live any of my purpose this past week. I didn't get to have that, that fulfilling feeling. And so that's where I had found myself. I, was in, I found myself in this position where I felt unfulfilled all the time. And typically when we feel this way, it's because we haven't discovered our purpose yet. It's because we have a void inside of us that needs to be filled by what God has called us to do. And so what I want to do is I want to jump into a story, a timeline of events, if you will, of the Israelites. They're in exile. They've been pushed out of their home country due to the fact of their beliefs and everything they've got going on. And we see the, the word from Jeremiah come. God realizes, man, these people are frustrated. It's kind of like some of us feeling frustrated with our jobs. We're like, God, seriously? Like, I need something better than this. And I have to imagine this is what the, the Israelites feel like. They're probably thinking, God, we're out here because we believe in you, and this is what we get. Thank you. Like, you know, they, they got to that point of frustration. And so he gives this word to the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster and to give you a future and a hope. It's a pretty well-known verse. Matter of fact, I would say this is actually a promise from God. And so if it was a promise back then, that means it's still a promise now. I have a question for you. Do you think God's words after he spoke the world to existence began to cease that they no longer existed? Of course not, because when you're God and you speak words out and you begin to create things, it's just like when my voice goes out, or your voice was to go out, if you could see the, the sound waves, they go on and they bounce, and they go somewhere else and they bounce, and they're forever. And so if God gave a purpose and a plan back then, that means we all still have a God-given purpose here and now. The word plan is kind of, a, I think, an intriguing word to look at here, because who's ever had a plan that's gone horribly wrong? Who's ever been in a relationship and then all of a sudden you're like, the person's like, deuces, I don't want this anymore. Peace out, and they're gone. And all of a sudden you're stuck with your new life. Or maybe you have this bill, like you're like saving up for this sweet ride, and all of a sudden you're like a couple thousand bucks away, and then this big, huge bill comes in that you weren't expecting for maybe a medical procedure. And you're like, oh, why? Why? And you, you, you keep going through these things over and over. And so our best laid plans seem to always get messed up. But when you actually look at the translation here for the Hebrew word, plans or thoughts, it actually is mahakashba. So I need you guys to do me a favor. Say mahakashba. That means purpose. And I also just taught you some Hebrew, so you're welcome. But purpose is forever. Plans are temporary. See, your purpose never changes. Your purpose is always going to remain the same because it's God-given, where your plans always fluctuate depending on what you're going through in life. 
I actually heard it best said this way. Purpose is like a compass or a lighthouse that provides an overarching aim and direction for our lives. The really cool part about a compass, who's ever seen a compass? Most of you? If you haven't seen one, you should totally look it up on your phone right now. It's going to make your, it's going to blow your mind when you see this. So a compass, at the very center point of a compass, there's this little dot, right? That little dot is what they call the center mast. The center center mast actually helps this uh, uh, arrow be able to perfectly balance. And the idea is that this arrow is perfectly balanced, and as it's perfectly balanced, the Earth's magnetic fields actually begin to always point it due north. And so the idea is, if you turn this way and you're going, say, north, east, I had to think that out through, if you're going east, and you, you know you're supposed to be going north, you're pointing this way, but it, it, arrows always going to the north. Or say you decide to go to the west, and you're like, well, God, that plan was horrible, so I'm going to do my own plan now. And all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, my plan's not working out, but God's plan is always north. And all of a sudden, you realize that you're being recalculated north. And so what compass is, it's almost like the purpose of God. It's like the center of that is our purpose. And in that moment, we find ourselves in this position where God's always constant. He's never leaving us. And so just like the center mast, he's always there to redirect us every time that we fail. God is almost like our personal GPS to our purpose. To kind of illustrate this, I have a case study of Moses. Who's ever heard of Moses? If you haven't heard of Moses, he's got a pretty radical story, and I'm getting ready to share it with you. So Moses was born into this crazy time in life. He wasn't born into a time like it was like perfect. He was born into a time that was really bad. He was born into a time where his entire people were in slavery. Could you imagine being born and literally every day of your life, from the time that you wake up to the time that you finally take your last breath, you're literally being told what to do? And it's not like, hey, go move that seat over there. It's pick up heavy bricks in the 100 degree sun with no anything. It's just hot, nasty hot water that you get to drink that's dirty and it's disease infested and everything is going bad. And if you screw it up even once, it's not like a shame on you. It's a wow with a whip as you fall to the ground and you get beat and beat and beat until you get up. That's what he was born into. And so his mom instantly takes Moses as he's born and she begins to hide him. And the reason she begins to hide him is because the Pharaoh of the time, which is what we would call like kind of like a modern day king or the president without a Senate or a Congress, he actually sets up this law and he says, all the baby boys born from this point forward have to be aborted. And the reason he does this is because he realizes they're starting to lose their stranglehold over the Hebrew people because they're starting to grow in such big numbers that here soon the men would outnumber their men, and that means they would lose the ability to control. And so he tells the midwives this, and the midwives do something spectacular. See, they understand that taking someone's life when it's their own to make that decision, it's, it's completely wrong. And so it goes against what God has called them to do, and so it went against their beliefs, and they simply said, we're not doing it. And so what they do is they have these opportunities to abort the babies. And so what they uh, end up doing is they end up showing late to the, the baby boys. They know these baby boys are coming, and they kind of slowly walk their way there. And all of a sudden, when the babies are born, whoops, it's gone. Isn't that a neat whoopsie? Well, Pharaoh gets really angry. How could you let this happen? And this is their explanation to Pharaoh. Well, see, when the, the baby girls are born, it takes them like this really long time to come out. And we don't know what to do. Like, we, you know, we're like trying to get these moms to, to push, and they're just not. And, and by the time they come out, we're just so tired. And then, you know, then a baby boy's born. And by the time we get there, they're just, it's boom, they're out of the birth canal, and they're gone. And so what he ends up doing is he ends up sending out a whole bunch of authorities to begin to look for baby boys. So his mother goes place to place to place, hiding baby Moses, until she realizes that she can no longer take care of her son. Now, I don't know how you would feel as a parent, but me, it'd be the most gut-wrenching decision in the world to have to make to say, I'm sorry I can't take care of you anymore, and I'm sorry I can't protect you. And so I'm going to send you down the river in hopes that you find someone who can give you a better life. And so she begins to prepare a basket. She tar seals it. She puts baby Moses into the basket, and she sets it down into the river, and she sends him on his way down. And his little sister, who I had to think was absolutely heartbroken, does the, the best thing a little sister can do. She becomes a second mom. And she begins to follow her little brother down the stream. Moses gets halfway down, and then all of a sudden, his sister becomes dismayed. She looks up, and she realizes, oh, my gosh, that's, that's Pharaoh's, that's his army. That's his people. They're coming down here. And she begins to freak out. And I have to imagine at this point, she's praying, God, like, you've let him go through all this. Why would you let him die now? And begins to, to panic. And she begins to pray. And then all of a sudden, 
Pharaoh's daughter comes down with all of her handmaidens and the guards stop and they begin to bathe themselves. And as the, the basket gets closer and closer, eventually they reach down and they pick it up and there's baby Moses. It's interesting to note that Pharaoh's daughter, her name actually means daughter of God. See, what the enemy had meant for Moses, you know, to be destruction, he wanted them killed at the very beginning. And so when that didn't work, he's like, well, we're going to send him down the river. He'll drown that way. Oh, well, what he meant for destruction, God uses a promotion for life. He ends up being raised. We fast forward 20 years because we've got the magic of the fast forward button now. And all of a sudden, we see Moses as a young 20-something. He has the finest education, the greatest clothes, the greatest shoes. I'm sure if they had Lamborghinis back then, there would have been one sitting in the driveway. And everything is great in his life, right? He ends up learning how to love people just like his mom did because that's who she was. That was part of her DNA. That was part of her purpose was to love people. It was to raise Moses. And so Moses gets to the point where he begins to wanting to discover his own purpose. What am I here for? And all of a sudden he discovers that he's a Hebrew. He's actually, in fact, not Egyptian like he thought he was growing up. And so he kind of ponders this for a moment and he begins to take a walk. And all of a sudden he sees a slave master start beating one of the Hebrew slaves to the point of almost killing him. And this, this loving good nature inside of him turns into rage and his blood begins to boil. And he waits for nobody to be looking and he runs down instantly and strikes down the slave master. He actually takes and kills him and throws him in the sand and buries him. And over the next couple of days, he would think, I helped him out. I did a good job. I, he begins to have that second down, like, what did I just do? I totally just killed somebody. Uh, 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 it's okay. It's, 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 it's okay. God, God still got this. And then his heart begins to be activated again because he sees two of his people fighting, two of the Hebrews. He goes down and says, what are you guys doing? I just saved your bacon. Like, why are you guys fighting? And the Hebrew stops and looks at him and says, are you our king now? Are, are you going to tell me what to do? Are you going to bury me in the sand if I don't listen? And so this young 20-year-old begins to panic. He begins to be feeling overwhelmed as if everybody knows his sin. Everybody knows his failure. And so he begins to take off running. And he runs to the Red Sea and crosses the Red Sea into to Midian. You know, the interesting part about all of this is God's purpose for, for Moses didn't change because he murdered someone. I would say that's a pretty serious crime, a pretty serious sin, if you will, to say that, hey, I don't like you. I'm going to stab you, Mason. Come here. Gink! I mean, that's a huge deal, right? To kill someone, to take someone's life away. But notice that God didn't take his purpose away. God didn't give Moses a lesser purpose. But does that mean that we should just go live willy-nilly and sin all we want? Well, of course not. Because when you sin, you bring hell and destruction into your life. And so if you do bad things, bad things come. It's the sowing and reaping principle. And so now that we know that we cannot destroy our God-given purpose, where do we find Moses? Like I said before, he's in Midian. He finds himself in this place, in this desert of saying, all right, God, I'm finally free, away from everybody. And he becomes, or comes upon uh, these ladies who are, are trying to draw water from the well. And these shepherds show up, and it's a lot of, a lot of, you guys are horrible, women, equality, boo, bad things to you. And all of a sudden, his inner side, inside of him says, no, they have just as much right to be here as you do. And he sends the shepherds away and so becomes that hero, that, that rescuer. And so Jethro actually invites him in and eventually gives his daughter Zephora to, to Moses to marry. And so Moses has this great life out in the desert, gets a beautiful wife, everything's going great. His, his purpose isn't been being fulfilled yet, but he lives the next 40 to 50, maybe even up to 60 years in the desert. And then he begins to find his purpose. Who's ever heard of Ford Motor Company? Pretty big, right? Do you know Ford didn't start until his 40s, late 40s? Who's ever heard of KFC? Who's ever eaten KFC? Yeah, amen. He didn't start till his 60s. Crazy, right? And so Moses, now at age 70 to 80 years old, begins to have his call from God activated in his life, his purpose activated when he sees the burning bush. And so the second lesson that we can learn from Moses' life is this. You can out cannot outlive your God-given purpose. Your God-given purpose will always outlive you. That means no matter how long you put it off, it's always still there. It's yours. It's like going to buy a pair of shoes, right? That's kind of how we think of our purpose. Well, these, I don't really like this purpose. Can I have another one, God? Of course not. It's not like that. Our purpose is unique to us. 
I kind of joked about it in the last service, but it's kind of like having a foot from, like, you know, Lord of the Rings and Frodo Baggin, and it's all hairy, and you're like, ugh, I don't want this, God. Give me a new foot. But it's not like that because it's unique to you because you've seen things, and you've heard things, and you've experienced things, and it gives you your unique perspective. So your, your calling, your, your, your purpose is unique to you. Something that's noteworthy to note is through all of this, he finally discovers his purpose. He hasn't got to the Red Sea where he gets to finally stab the, the staff into the ground and whoosh, and all this greatness happens. But it's noteworthy to mention that he's not leading just a few people. Because God can like totally use somebody that screws up right, but only for a smaller group of people. That's funny because that's not what the Bible talks about. It actually talks about him leading some two and a half million people as a murderer, as a person that was a coward and ran away he was still able to lead two and a half million people. And to boot, he had a stuttering problem. I don't know if you've ever had a stuttering problem, but when you get up in front of someone, and you're especially when you get nervous, you're like, da 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 people are going to look at you like, okay, next, please. And so through all of this, no matter how far you run, no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard you try, you cannot escape your God-given purpose. And if this wasn't evidence enough through all of Moses' life, rest assured knowing this. God knew your story, and he knew all your bumps and bruises and all of your mountaintops, even before he handcrafted you into the unique person that you are right here today. And he still gave you your purpose. Let that sink in. He knew all of your failures. He knew all the things that you were going to screw up, and he still said, hey, Josh, I got a purpose for your life, and it's going to be to change people around you. You're going to love people like nobody else before. It begins to change how we see ourselves. To begin to land the big old spruce goose that is pet or purpose, because it's such a big topic, you're probably wondering, okay, that's great. I have a purpose, I think now, but how do I find my purpose? Well, here's the thing. We're all so different. There's too many variables for me to give you a eureka moment for me to say, Mike, this is exactly how you find your purpose. Because if I could do that, I'd be like the richest person in the world. But besides that, we have to look at Scripture. So one of the really cool things to note, anytime you see a promise in Scripture, it's almost always followed by the principle that activates it in the next few verses. And so Jeremiah 29, 11, we find that God has purpose for our life, but in Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13, he says this, In those days when you pray to me, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And so that's where it starts, is by seeking the Holy Spirit. As we continue to develop our relationship with Jesus, we will have understanding added to us. Philippians 4, 7, it talks about it. All the peace that surpasses all understanding will become known to us. Everything that we need to know will become known to us through our relationship with who? Jesus. And so we seek what he has for us. King Solomon wrote these famous words in Proverbs 16, 9. Within your heart you can make plans for your future, but the Lord chooses your steps to get there. It comes back to the analogy of a compass. See, your purpose is at the center, and it doesn't matter how many times you turn to the left because you finally have things going perfect in your life or how many times you turn to the right because, thanks, God, I got it from here. I'm feeling much better now, and you're just going to have to deal with my choices. It doesn't matter how many times we do that because he's always going to recalculate and recalculate and recalculate us back to our purpose, back to the place that we should be going in life. And so what we should be doing is we should be looking for our passions to see where they align with what the Holy Spirit is speaking. It's something that we talked about last week. Part of what fills your joy box is your passion. Jesus, yes, is at the center. But when you begin to live in your passion daily, it begins to fill your joy, bo your joy box. And when your joy box is completely fu uh, full, like we talked about last week, there's good things in life and there's bad things in life. The good things come to complement your joy. The bad things are pushed away because you've got so much joy that it overflows and pushes them out of your life. And it's the same thing. And so once we know that our, our passions are aligned with the Holy Spirit, we always have to leave our future open to possibilities. As long as we leave our heart open for what God has for us, things will always go better than they are right now. And the final thing I would like to leave you this morning as we're running out of time is joy is a byproduct of our passion. And if we learned that joy is a byproduct of our passion last week, that means our passion needs to be a byproduct of our purpose. Seek God for your purpose and allow it to be added to your life. Seek the kingdom of God first and everything will be added unto you. If you could stand as we're out of time, I want to pray over you. And what I'm believing is when we pray that we're going to see purpose unlocked in your life. 
that it will begin to send some of you on a journey that you've never been on before. So Father, I love you and I thank you for allowing us to be here together as a family today. I give you praise and honor, Lord. I ask that you would begin to use your Holy Spirit to minister to each and every one of us individually, Lord, that you would begin to share those intimate things that you've placed in us from birth, Lord, as it talks about in Psalms 139. Lord, we know that you're a father of good and that everything that you have is for good. And so I love and I thank you for that, Father. And we give you praise and honor. In your beautiful name we pray, amen. 